Dead Island 2 is a game that helps perfectly replicate what Los Angeles looks like in the present day, which means it's just a city that's burning to the ground extremely quickly. This is simply because every YouTuber and their mothers all live there and are corrupting the city from the inside out thanks to them farming cringe content. But that's okay, because the zombies are here to send us content creators back into the algorithm hell where we belong. During this exciting, perilous, and pretty quirked up adventure, we follow the journey of the legendary video game protagonist with an S, several different slayers that tried to escape YouTube HQ but failed. But for the sake of this adventure, we're gonna focus on one slayer specifically, that being Danny DeVito, on her quest to journey through and escape the terrifyingly realistic landscape of Hell A, a city that has been ravaged by both YouTube's furry community and every Valentine's breakup imaginable. And during her blood-soaking journey through deadly breakups, killing the entirety of Twitter and slaying many undead women that I can't be in love with because they're zombies, like, come on, she will encounter some things that will make both me and her question, what in the actual frick did Los Angeles think it was gonna do when the guy that lost his best in slot GF decided to cause an apocalypse just to be a cuck. Some of these things include the average white male, my fake girlfriend when she doesn't get a gift from me, my dad, and much more. This is the tale of a game that was believed to be dead years ago. A game announced at E3 2014, only to then release nine Dear years God. later. It spent 11 years bouncing between studio after studio for being stuck in development <laughs> hell, to then release, quite frankly, 10 years after its gameplay felt new and unique. It's a game that deserved more, and is a sequel to what was heralded at one point in time as one of the greatest in the zombie genre. And what better way to spend my Valentine's Day than by playing a game where everyone is dead. Oh. The city famous for its love of Hollywood stars and cute expensive girlfriends is lost, and an accurate simulator that shows that every time I try to approach someone, I get a gun pointed at my face or nearly get killed. Now that sounds like my love life in a nutshell. This is Dead Island 2. Oh, yeah. It's no surprise that Dead Island 2 shocked the gaming world when it was shadow revealed at Gamescom 2022. I remember seeing its revealed trailer and questioning to myself what this game was, mostly because I haven't played the first one, only to see the title drop and be like, YES! OH MY GOD! There's a fair bit to talk about with this game. From its simple gameplay, its gorgeous LA-inspired world, its fair share of flaws, and its insanely detailed and troubled development history. But before we get into those things, let's talk about the story of Dead Island 2. Because as troubled as this game may have been, the developers at least thought of putting a half decent story into it. And let's be frank though, if there wasn't a story involved, then how am I going to explain to my fake girlfriend that I was playing a romance simulator but with zombies? Yeah, so 15 years after the events of Dead Island 1, you know, the one that actually took place on an island, Los Angeles gets a wake-up call that says, yo, the zombies crossed the ocean and now they're here to rail us. They didn't actually do this, but it's a funny thought nonetheless. Regardless, the military quarantined the entire city, and as the virus runs rampant, our group of six slayers are intent on boarding the last evac flight out of the city. And whilst they successfully do so, they forgot about the one infected passenger on board, who then turns and rips somebody apart. Probably should have checked that, but hey, a dank party in the airplane does sound fun, yeah? Their plane is shot down by the military, and after getting bitten themselves trying to save some survivors, they decide to seek shelter at Emma John's mansion. For context, Emma John is basically the girlfriend of your dreams if you happen to live in LA. Therefore, the Slayers make it their plan to leave LA and bring as many people with them as possible. But as with most video games and thanks to the book of things that must occur in video games, some massive plot twists will come in throughout the game that will ultimately change this outcome. Okay, I think that explains the entire story in a nutshell. So let's jump into the game itself by talking about the gameplay of Dead Island 2. After all, this isn't the love capital of the world, that's Paris, but it may as well be because this is about as close as I'm gonna get to it. So sit back as I maul several undead girls in bikinis and question my sanity, as it's time to see if Hell A can deliver a fun gameplay experience. And honestly, it does it pretty well. Arriving in Hell A, you'll come to realize that the populace has smoked so much crack that they're now decomposing and are forcing you to submit to Jeffrey Bezos' new medication known as death. Not to mention, they love to be hit with pretty much anything you can throw at them, which in the case of my broke white bum, that involves Daddy YouTube's belt. And speaking of the populace, I should probably talk about them, as there's quite a few different zombie variants that you're going to be facing whilst exploring Hell A. Let's start with your basic zombies, the Shamblers. These guys are the equivalent of the homeless people that inhabit LA today, as they can break themselves just by swinging their arms 
arms a single time. They're also replicating how I feel both at work and around women in shambles. Either that or how Point Crow feels every single day. Above them are walkers, your standard zombie that most people are familiar with. However, walkers have a rather large array of variants of their own, with 11 total variants that you'll be facing throughout Hell A. This brings with it a costume change and even some resistances to various damage effects. For example, the Shocking Walker will pulsate electricity around itself periodically and has full resistance to all shock attacks. That way you can't shock it for when you break up with him. Sounds familiar. The Grenadier has no resistances, but has a bomb strapped to its back. It's fully ready to explode when you hit it, just to let you know that you messed up trying to get that girl and now you must pay for it in the form of death. Firefighters are immune to fire, shock, caustic, and water attacks, just to make sure that you cannot use these to get them away from your house for when you dropped your fire mixtape on your girlfriend last night. Yes, I went there. Let's not forget the Riot Gear Walker, which is immune to all damage effects and ranged attacks, and will require you to break his armor in order to land a single blow. This guy is the literal embodiment of the I'm a virgin, don't touch me bit, otherwise known as me in all aspects. The last one I'll touch on here are spiky walkers, which can only be hit with heavy weapons like hammers and two-handed axes. I guess you could say, they F with it heavy. Runners are much like walkers, they just run really fast and have a rather concerning amount of agility. They have six variants of their own, most of which being the same variants you'll find in walkers. They also really help show that yes, they're running after you because they want a taste of that bum. And I'm sorry to tell you zombie ladies, but that's off limits right now. Crushers are the tall, extremely jacked zombies that are trying to steal the crown of being the fifth prestige veteran of beating their you know what from its current holder, the Charger from Left 4 Speed 2. These guys don't do too much mechanically, just dodge his big AOE by jumping over it and sever his arms off so he can't fish your face in for failing to actually talk to any girl you know. If anything, this guy is just here to give me the pep talk of a century. That being, bro, you suck at talking to women, you're better off with a stuff though. <laughs> There's also an Inferno variant of this crusher, which does the same things as the normal one, but he's now on fire. Clearly his girlfriend was pissed off last night, and it seems that he's dealing with the aftermath. Bursters are basically this game's version of the boomer like from Left 4 Dead, in the sense that yes, it does explode and attract zombies to your location, but also that yes, this is probably a guy who spent most of his life playing World of Employee Harassment in his mom's basement whilst eating Doritos and drinking Mountain Dew, otherwise known as the average Taco Bell employee. Wait, that's not me, what the fuck? Slobbers are more like boomers though, cause he spits out caustic fluids around him and makes you melt in your pants. What? Sounds dope. They resist everything but shock, sharp, and bleed damage, so dodge their range attacks and green bile and take them down. Putrefied slobbers look like something ripped straight out of my nightmares, with a shiz ton of tentacle henty coming straight out of his chest. This mother duck is literally the ugly bastard of the zombie world, and is turning me on in a way that makes me want to kill him. They do similar attacks to their base counterpart, but they hit much harder and much faster, and are now resistant to bleed damage, so shock and sharp damage will be your best friend. They also have a firestorm variant, so if you like fire raining down from the skies or you're trying to cause several acts of dismemberment, the then I think I have the game for you. Screamers are the present day equivalent of a relationship gone wrong. Clearly Karen wasn't happy that you didn't give her another gift for your seventh night out, after you'd already given her six gifts already. Ready. So now she's sending some of her friends to rip your chill off in response. She ain't getting it, no one is. Screamers obviously scream for an extended period of time, alerting all zombies in the area to your location. There's also Voltic Screamers that are similar to the Shocking Walkers from earlier. They just explode in a brilliant flash of lights when they scream, because that's what women do, right? Who knows, maybe screaming teenage girls is your kink, and if it is, the fuck is wrong with you? Last I checked, you're not Ryan Haywood, or literally any BTS enjoyer. Butchers are what happens to Gordon Ramsay when he has truly had enough of your shit. He's ready to stab you with his rather long and concerningly quirky nails. Oh, no. They're resistant to blunt, fire, and bleed damage, and can block your attacks thanks to their arms that are damage proof. Normal butchers will also run to a nearby corpse to heal themselves when they get low, so make sure you have a gun or some kind of throwable to stop them from healing. Lord knows what zombified Gordon Ramsay would say after eating some zombies for breakfast. Probably something like, this wrong. They also have a variant called the Vicious Butcher, arguably the deadliest enemy in the entire game, and for good reason. Because if you wanted to get your balls chopped off after failing so bad at being a guy that you literally had to play a video game to make it happen, then this mother duck is how you're gonna get it done. His vicious brother is faster than ever and can regenerate health with every Here attack he makes. And he does this by eating his own oh, arm, fuck. perfectly showing what every anime fan does when battling for best girl. You better know how to dodge and bring some caustic modded weapons with you, as this can of whoop ass is gonna show you the harsh realities of the hood in Hell A. And finally, on our Zompedia tour, we have mutators. These guys will look much like normal walkers, but once they transform, they become the unfathomable abominations that was created by Professor Putricide inside Ice Crown Citadel in 2010. Otherwise, this may in fact be what your mother turns into when you piss her off. Whilst being resistant to projectile and explosive damage, that doesn't mean you can use a gun and mow them down. In fact, I encourage you that 
that you do use a gun. Because, let's be frank, their movement is largely similar to that of the Crushers from earlier, but with the added feature that they'll throw spike projectiles at you and cause you to bleed profusely. Aim for the legs, and this guy is a cakewalk. Although he, too, is challenging the Charger for that fifth prestige spot. I mean, look wow. at those arms, yo. I say all these things about these zombies, but you're gonna need some weapons and guns in order to maim and slay anything that comes in your way. And for that, we gotta talk about the weapons. As you'd expect, weapons are scattered all across Hell A for you to find, whether this be on zombies, in loot crates, sitting around in buildings, or given as quest rewards. These weapons have a quality associated with them, with gray being uncommon and working your way to orange as legendary. Weapons generally do higher damage the better the quality, and will also have higher durability and have more room for upgrades. What? Using the workbench, you can put damage modifiers and upgrades onto any weapon or gun in the game to help you take the fight to the undead, otherwise known as the cute girls at Venice Beach. This includes making an electric katana that deals bonus limb damage, or a pistol that can light its enemies on fire and reload faster. Even a massive sledgehammer that, while it might attack slowly, it will hit really hard and apply caustic damage to its target. All of these upgrades will need to be unlocked by gathering blueprints, which you'll find scattered throughout Hell A. Not to mention, you'll also need various crafting materials to apply these perks and upgrades to your weapons. This helps encourage exploration by allowing the player to search for what they need inside of houses, shops, completing side quests, or killing zombies. Bear in mind these two things though. One, you can scrap and dismantle any weapons that you may not want, and you'll get both the materials for that weapon as well as the materials for any upgrades that are on that weapon given right back to you. And secondly, you can only hold up to a max of 99 of any consumable or part, so keep this in mind when you're out exploring. Do note that yes, weapons, blueprints, and materials can also be bought at the many vendors that you'll find more? in safe houses. About? Generally, however, buying weapons is not the best idea, as you can find equally good weapons really? by exploring the world. You can also sell weapons here too if you're looking for some extra cash, as putting upgrades on your gear, repairing your weapons, or level matching your weapons to your current level will all cost money. So make sure you are aware of what you have in the bank before you do this. You'll also want to keep track of a couple of smaller things on your weapons, like speed, which will help you determine how fast you can attack with that weapon. The smaller this value is, the harder it's going to hit, and usually the force, the harder you hit, will generally be harder with low speed weapons. Honestly, that sounds similar to how the average Texas male treats their wife. He'll have enough speed to leave her at a moment's notice, but still have a high enough force to completely destroy them when they least expect it. Don't forget about durability as well, as some upgrades can help improve it and make your weapons last longer. Because there's nothing more devastating than having the time of your life slaying women at the Santa Monica Pier, only for your weapon to then break and lose half your health because of it. We also have to talk about the throwables, aka curveballs, the that the game gives you. These are some extra pieces of utility that you can use when you're out slaying Zs in Hell A. And there's a rather large amount of diversity between them. How about the meat bait, which will attract most zombies to its target location like it's a hot naked anime yes. girl, allowing you to throw a grenade, molotov, or a pipe bomb to explode those zombies. I got to love that gore though, because it's very similar to what I experience in my daily love life. It's really gore, let me tell you. You also have caustic bombs, which will explode with that same green jazz from earlier, or a flashbang so that you can speed out of there after receiving the I'm Home Alone text. Or you have the classic shuriken so that you can become the most badass ninja Hell A's ever seen. Not that that's gonna matter though, because let's be frank, if you got zombified Gordon Ramsay, a screaming Karen, and a degenerate buff AF white guy lying around, I don't think you're gonna be very stealthy for very long, Chief. <laughs> and lastly, for the gameplay segment, we gotta talk about the newest ripoff of a system in the gaming industry. Do you guys remember Back for Blood? Okay, well, if you don't remember that game at all, do you remember that game's card system, which allowed the player to build a deck of cards that played to their playstyle? Well, I'm happy to tell you that Dead Island 2 has a similar system, except it's much smaller in scale. Sounds like my Self-esteem. <laughs> Separated into Ability, Slayer, Survivor, and Newman brackets, you can pick and choose what cards you play and what skills you have. And much like Back for Blood, these skills can be changed to fit your playstyle. But with the right combinations, you can make some killer builds that can fit to however you want to play the game. In addition, you'll later gain access to something called Autophage. This in of itself has major lore implications, but the TLDR is that Autophage is basically what the game calls an immortal infected human, and it has three tiers. The further down you get in these tiers, you'll receive massive benefits, but also some massive negatives as well. Take the third tier as an example. You'll gain a boost to health and damage, and your fury mode duration will be increased, and killing zombies will replenish fury. Oh, right, I forgot to mention this part. 
Fury Mode allows you to transform into one of the undead and go on a murderous rampage, killing everything in sight. Legit sounds like any girl on a Saturday night, am I right, boys? There are multiple different cards that can help make Fury Mode become incredibly powerful, so make sure that you're using it quite often. Regardless, you will still get negatives with this tier, including no forms of natural health regeneration and reduced healing from all forms of healing items. You increase this tier bar by equipping autophage cards, which are marked with small white skulls. Having one or two in your deck is fine, just don't go crazy, otherwise you're gonna end up going insane. Let's be honest here, I haven't gone crazy yet because let's be honest, lusting after real women causes suicidal depression, and I'm not there yet. Ability cards give the player new abilities, or alter their current ones to make them stronger and more capable in combat. So if you wanted a stomp attack that says be gone thought at the collection of bikini babes at Venice Beach, then these cards are for you. Slayer and survivor cards are generally specific to passive benefits to things like drop kicks, maiming zombies, or counters that can give you more health, stat bonuses, or a damage boost. Newman is the last category, and most of its cards are autophage cards. These cards, much like the autophage tiers, have both a good oh, and a bad effect. Going. Take anger management as an example. You'll stay in fury mode for longer, but will instead drain health over time until you leave fury mode, which can be a bad thing if you're getting railed by a group of zombies. You can unlock these cards by reaching certain levels, completing specific quests, finding them as rare drops off specific zombie variants, or finding them lying around in houses and shops all around hell. LA. One other small detail that I'm going to mention briefly is online multiplayer. There really isn't much to talk about here because it's basically just a single player game but with extra players, but strangely though, you can only play with a maximum of three people, which really caused some controversy given that four is usually the magic number when it comes to multiplayer. But let's be real, Dan Buster probably wanted to be a little bit different with their multiplayer, which is what I would say when dating most women. <laughs> Overall, Hell A is quite the exciting adventure with a whole host of gameplay options for you to play with. With loads of different zombies types waiting for you on the streets, you better zip up your pants and be ready because you're probably about to fill them up 12 times over. It's a system that has enough variance in it that it makes the game refreshing and full of character. It's not as simple as equip the best weapon and go, and while that might work, it's better to go in with the plan, and these zombie types force the player to make one, which is a good thing. The weapon system is ready to help you take the fight to your local teenage high school. Boy do I love causing my fake girlfriend's internal bleeding, it's not like they have to experience that on the regular anyway. And we cannot forget about the skill card tree thing, allowing the player to earn bonuses and alter their experience to play how they want to play, and not make them feel like they have to play in a specific way. It's a basic feature, but it always helps add that extra charm to a game, and I'm glad it's here. But with that being said, it's time we move into the next major segment of the video. I've talked a lot about Hell A so far, but I really haven't delved into the city itself. So let me tell you about everything you need to know about Hell A itself. Welcome to Hell A, population you and all the undead women. It's pretty surreal to think that Los Angeles lost the battle with the undead, given that a large portion of its IRL population is zombies. It's even more strange that no one thought to defend themselves very much either, but then again, all of the YouTubers live there, and as content creators, we don't really think about these things, mostly because we assume it's a live stream and that it's also VR. Hell A has 11 total areas for us to explore, so let's run it down the list of places that you can visit on your travels. Grab a seat, because this is going to be a long one. Bel Air! Sitting on the outer reaches of the city just down the street from the famous Hollywood sign, Bel Air captures a similar feeling to that of Beverly Hills, but if it was much smaller, more contained, and easier to manage. Sounds like what I wish my life was like altogether. It's strange that this is probably the closest I'll ever get to the Hollywood sign, because why would I ever actually visit LA to begin with? Maybe to visit any content creator ever, sure, but that's basically about it. If you ever wanted to raid some of the most expensive mansions in the country, then Bel Air is a great place to do that. Who wouldn't want to go into that mansion of that super cute girl that you met at school the other day? You know, the one that has the rich dad who works at Nintendo. Boy, wouldn't you want to sneak in there and just cause a little bit of mischief. I sure would. Just don't trip the alarms, otherwise the infected are going to come and beat you up. There is at least a rich guy named Curtis Sinclair, who has a rather large booze collection. You know, that's convenient, because I know someone who drinks a lot and would probably get along like really well with this guy. They know who they are. Beverly Hills! We can't have a game set in Hollywood without having Beverly Hills, or as I like to call it, Vinewood Hills. Sounds better, shut up. With stunning views of the City of the Damned and even more houses to raid and conquer, it's no surprise that Michael from GTA 5 lives in one of these houses and is gearing up to call Franklin and Trevor to come whip some ass. Either it's that Michael or the Michael I know, the one that would call up Jose and use him as bait. There's also the remnants of a band that lives here too, and you end up helping them get their band back together. And I'm wondering as to why you may want to do that. Why, you may ask? Dog, you 
realize there's zombies outside your doorstep, right? Nope. Why would you want to play Nobody loud music cares. given that's the case? This guy's just asking to die. There's also this lady who is so addicted to arts and crafts that she may as well be cosplaying as a Victoria's Secret model. She's so addicted that she sends you on a plethora of side quests to get various zombie parts. In doing so, she gives you a legendary weapon at the end, but the fact remains, why is she so addicted? The Brentwood Sewer! If you are having issues holding in that vomit from splattering zombies in Beverly Hills, then I'm about to make you throw up right now. The Brentwood Sewer is home to many things, mostly including the entire homeless population of California, as well as all of the fecal matter that the entire country produces. I'm not saying that all of it goes here, but it definitely seems like it. This section serves as the connection point from Bel Air to Venice Beach. Although I gotta say, this would be a dope evil lair. Either that, or it's a place for activities. The Halperin Hotel. One of the first areas you'll come across when playing this game is, funny enough, a hotel. Yeah. This is perfect. Now I can take my imaginary girlfriend that I've been holding hands with for the entire game so far, which is about an hour, and get a room and take a nice nap. Oh, dear God. Okay, never mind. I ain't doing that. I'm gonna be real, though. Their service feels like I just walked into a flippin' Denny's and it sucked, which I guess is me saying that the service at Denny's is AIDS. There's a shockingly large amount of stuff to find at the Halperin Hotel, so keep your eyes peeled. You may even find your true love there. I sure as hell didn't. I've been looking for Let's see, 16 carry the two, 10 years, and I still haven't found it yet. Monarch Studios! Are you ready, kids? Because we're heading on a field trip to the set of Hollywood's newest blockbuster, known only as Maidenless by White Guy. This place can be confusing to navigate, just like my love life, that's just is like surfing through lively footage. Holy With seven sound sets to choose from, you'll find some rather strange places, including a city set to make us feel like we're in a makeshift version of Brooklyn. What's next, a butcher's gonna show up and gut Rachel right in front of me? I wouldn't care, so long as they don't gut my friends, who are girls, we're good. How about the jungle set, which is making me wonder where the rolling ball of doom is? You can't make a jungle set and not put an Indiana Jones reference. And now I'm pissed. How about what looks like the set of a show filmed with a live studio audience? You can only imagine that there's always going to be a screener here and there will always be a horde here. Yes, this set and this episode is being filmed in front of a live studio Benedict. The, the audience is just undead and is really pissed off that I called them a racial slur. What? Oh yeah, we can't forget the giant spider battle next to the gas station. Now there is a green screen here, so let's see what I can put on it real quick. Not that. Not that either. Hey, oh, yo, that what the? There. Ah, that's better. Venice Beach! Ah, uh, yes. Welcome to paradise, my friend. Take a seat by the beach and try not to get your chill ripped off Holy. by those crazy girls that are running around like they're high on crack. Smoke. Venice is actually one of the larger areas of this game, complete with streets filled with shops to raid and pillage, and the entire beach at your disposal. Check out the clothing shops to acquire some fat drip. Visit the police station to get mauled by the officers that tried to arrest you for simply putting your shoulder on a non-single hey, woman, no. and even visit the massive military base sitting on the beach. You better believe that the military base got overrun, because even the military can't can't stop this outbreak, but let's be fair, they probably saw undead bikini girls and glanced in the wrong place, thus resulting in them being ripped to shreds. There's also this guy that chose to hide in this lifeguard tower, and thus became a bit of a cut after leaving his friends to die in this building. That's kind of messed up. I'll leave my review of this place on Yelp. Cute girls, fun attractions, almost died. 5 out of 10. The Santa Monica Pier! Probably one of the most recognizable piers in the entire United States of Socialism, the Santa Monica Pier returns in Dead Island 2, complete with probably the darkest and creepiest section of this game. It genuinely made me get jump scared several times. Yes, a 20 year old white guy who gets scared talking to girls also gets scared when a zombie jumps me in a porta potty. Shocker, I know. I gotta hand it to the devs here though. This is by far my favorite level in the game, just because of the atmosphere that it gives during the night and the level's simplicity. This is also the level that the butcher is introduced via a boss, as all the special infected variants are also introduced through bosses. But dear God, this fight is the hardest one in the game by far on your first go. I truly hate clowns, let alone zombie clowns. I feel like I'm Columbus from Zombieland when looking at this thing. First date? It's gotta be here at the pier. Yes, I know I don't live in California, but hey, a man can dream, okay? Ocean Avenue! You know, it's kind of strange to think that this level is called Ocean Avenue, yet I don't see the ocean, so uh, this game just lied to me right in front of my face. This area is mostly taken up by the Serling Hotel, home to the doctor that literally caused the entire apocalypse, so uh, you can imagine what I did to him. I definitely didn't stuff him into an animatronic suit, made him get a, a bit, bit quirky, quirky, and then made him bust it down sexual style officer, I swear. You also got some cool stores in the area, like this coffee shop that is actually the base of the doc's daughter, serious? who perfectly recreates how most girls interact with me when I 
I even remotely try to ask them to hang out. They either ignore me or change the subject. There's also what can basically be described as an Apple store, complete with talking robotic devices that are just dictionaries on wheels. I hate humanity even more now. I don't want to listen to a dictionary. I'll just figure out what the word love means myself. It is Valentine's Day after all, so I'm sure I'll figure it out. This level is all right at best, and it's nothing really special. I just wish I could have seen the ocean though. The Metro. We've somehow managed to travel to New York to get a taste of what the New York subway system looks and smells like. Comment if you agree, New Yorkers. <laughs> Regardless, this area serves as the second to last area of the game, complete with lots of zombies that will truly test if you are ready to finally get the girl. Yes. That's assuming you're playing as a dude. I'm not, so I guess I'm down bad for Sam B and not Emma John. There's this big battle towards the end that leads you out of the subway, and it's pretty intense. I'm surprised that this many zombies just so happen to know where I am at any given moment, because last I checked, I haven't been chipped in my bum, so how do they know exactly? I demand answers. Hollywood Boulevard! It took 17 hours of gameplay to finally get to Hollywood itself. I'm just pissed off that we didn't get a section dedicated to, you know, the entirety of downtown LA. Regardless, this level is really small, and it's just a straight line, so there really ain't that much to touch on. I like that the game makes the character feel old, though, by making the Doc's evil lab be behind a secret door in a store that sells lotion for old people. It's kind of rude, game. At least the final cutscene of the game is cool. We kill some dudes, then punch a crusher to realize that, oh, he's got a big chode. And then I say, psych, I got a bigger one. Well, that took longer than I thought, so let's touch on some other aspects of Hell A, most notably being the things that you'll find scattered throughout each of these areas. You'll obviously have loads of side quests to do as you explore Hell A. Some of these include helping a guitarist get his band back together, or solving the mystery of dead friends on the beach, maybe saving these girls from a butcher at the news station, or helping a YouTuber make several viral videos, or looking for a rogue reviewer on the Santa Monica Pier. There's also lost and found quests. These quests usually involve finding a certain person or a lost weapon. In doing so, you'll get the weapon that you found as a reward, or even other items like blueprints, cash, or experience. These tend to be a little more difficult to find compared to your standard side quests, but that's why I like them. They challenge the player to explore the environment to achieve a goal, kind of like you're working towards something. Sounds like me working towards a girlfriend. Speaking of exploring the environment, there's loads of things that you'll find whilst exploring Hell A that will simply tell you, come back later with a key or something, bud. Lockers and chests will be locked with unique keys and codes, which can be acquired through named zombies or quests. Usually these lockers have cash, blueprints, or parts in them, so it's worth your time to try and unlock them. You'll also find doors and or buildings that will require a fuse to open them. These can be purchased from any vendor in a safe no. house, and you can hold up to a max of three fuses at any given time. Use these to get into special loot areas where you can find loads of different parts for crafting and a guaranteed loot chest containing a purple quality weapon or gun. These are super useful and very cool areas, and there's at least a few of them in every map region. So if you got the time, check them out sometime, because you won't regret it. Overall, the world of Dead Island 2 is full of fun, vibrant locations to play around in. Whether that's the quiet but still hectic life up in Beverly Hills, to the calm ocean breeze mixed with the crazy battles on the Venice beach, to the sights of Hollywood Boulevard, or the happy music playing inside the Sterling Hotel on Ocean Avenue. There's loads of fun places to explore in Hell A. The things you'll discover in these areas are also pretty cool nice. too. The side quests are really dope, full of unique characters and challenge that make for a very solid experience. And the lost and found quests are a nice add-in to allow for the player to further explore the world that they're already exploring for materials and parts for their weapons. And the rewards like loot boxes, lockers, and fuse stashes are great for players wanting to go the extra mile and be rewarded for their efforts. I think I've talked enough in regards to the good about this game, so it's time to get into the last major segment of this video. I have quite a lot to say about this game, so let's get into it as I tell you the good and bad about Dead Island 2. There's quite a lot that I have to say about this game. There is a number of things that I wish this game did differently, and it mostly comes down to its troubled development. So to give you the context as to what I'm going to be talking about, take a seat as I delve a little deeper into the 11 year development cycle of Dead Island 2, as it'll help better explain why I have certain issues with this game. Back in 2006, Dead Island was revealed with an incredible CGI trailer, at the time being developed by Techland, the same developers of the Call of Juarez series and, most recently, the Dying Light franchise, and at the time being published by Deep Silver, who, 17 years after the game's announcement, would also be the publishers of Dead Island 2 in 2023. After the massive success of Dead Island 1, sometime in 2012 to 2013, Deep Silver made up their minds and that they wanted to make a sequel. However, the already made-up dev team over at Techland for 
developer Dead Island 2 wanted to move on to a different project that was currently being made internally at Techland. They were even throwing some ideas out for Dead Island 2 that were related to parkour, but they also wanted to bring this into their own project. That project and those parkour ideas would later become 2015's Dying Light, and its sequel later on in 2022. A smaller team at Techland would end up helping in making Dead Island Riptide, a smaller sequel and expansion-like game that followed the aftermath of Dead Island 1, that was received poorly for not fixing most of the original game's issues. But it was around this time in 2013 that Techland moved away from the franchise altogether, and would later turn their focus onto Dying Light in its future sequel, Dying Light 2, and has been focused there ever since. So Deep Silver then handed the development of Dead Island 2 over to a German studio by the name of Jaeger Productions. No, not the alcoholic kind, which at the time was best known for Spec Ops The Line, a game that was received as decent for its time being the 10th installment in its franchise. 2014 rolled around, and Deep Silver and Jaeger announced Dead Island 2 at E3 2014, with the famous Jogging Down Venice Beach trailer that became well known all around the world, and it would help set up the more comic-like tone that the series would have moving forward. But Deep Silver and Jaeger simply weren't working out. Not just that, but Dead Island 2 internally was seriously struggling, and the game was in deep trouble. Back in 2014, the game was running on Unreal Engine 4, and quite frankly, it doomed the game to ever hit the market. Dead Island 2 was planned to be, and already was at that time, a tried and true open world game in early development, and Unreal Engine 4 at that time was not designed to work with open world environments super well. So you can already imagine, this game was an utter mess. Therefore, the game was running pretty well on PCs, but was struggling even worse on consoles, most notably the PS4 and the Xbox One. Assets like buildings and objects simply weren't loading in properly, as the engine wouldn't prioritize the textures of assets based on player proximity like most engines do today. Therefore, the game was forcing everything to load all at once, instead of loading a certain amount within the player's view distance. Epic Games themselves even tried to offer support, and to put it blunt, Unreal Engine 4 at that time in 2014 was simply not capable of handling what Dead Island 2 was trying to be. Not to mention, Jaeger's dev team simply was not prepared for such a massive project, with only around 100 developers working on the game. Compare this to the 600 people working on Destiny at that time, and you can start to see why they were having some issues with development time. It got so bad that Deep Silver sent some engine architects from Volition, the same people that had worked on Saints Row and Red Faction, to try and fix some of the issues with the game's engine. And they couldn't do anything either. They straight up told Jaeger, you need to remake this from scratch, this isn't going to work. Jaeger then tried to fix this problem by taking the entirety of its mostly California-based map and diverting it into chunks, dividing it by loading screens to go for a more open-world sandbox approach, which is very similar to what we ended up getting in the release game in 2023. But sadly, by July 2015, Deep Silver and Jaeger parted ways, and this proved to be catastrophic for Jaeger Productions. This subdivision of Jaeger was born to be the team to develop Dead Island 2, and with the game being taken away from them thanks to Deep Silver, that entire branch of the company completely fell apart and filed for insolvency. People lost their jobs, and others left the company entirely, disappointed and heartbroken that the project they'd spent three years working on would never come to see the light of day. Five years after the cancellation of that project in 2020, a playable demo was leaked, showing what Jaeger Productions had made, and what Dead Island 2 would have probably looked like in around 2015. The game looked fairly decent, and had some areas that are seen in the game today, like Venice Beach and the Santa Monica Pier. It's believed that this game was ready to come to the market in 2015, but Deep Silver didn't want to release it. It's believed that they were worried that it may end up being another Riptide situation, and they simply didn't want to take that chance, and thus, they pulled the game. It's now March 2016, and Sumo Digital was now in charge of development of Dead Island 2. You know, that studio that was making Sonic racing games. This can only end badly. Sumo was told to bring what Jaeger had done up to Deep Silver's expectations, and to deliver the game within roughly the same time frame that Jaeger had. There is very little information as to what went down while Sumo Digital was working on Dead Island 2 throughout 2016 to 2019, except for some holding statements from Deep Silver proving that the game did exist and was still in development. But in 2019, thanks to a THQ financial report, it confirmed that Sumo Digital was no longer on the project. 
Instead, the game had been given to an internal studio over at Deep Silver, that being Dam Buster Studios. Bear in mind, this studio was made by people mostly from Free Radical Design, a Nottingham-based studio that was set up by GoldenEye veterans, who would later go on to create the Time Splitter series. By this point, the COVID pandemic was on the horizon, and with three different developers handling Dead Island 2 over the last five years, Deep Silver decided to go completely dark on both the game's development and when we'd see it again. From that point onwards, the game became a it'll be ready when it's ready sort of deal. But finally, three years later at Gamescom 2022, Dead Island 2 launched its re-announcement trailer with a concrete release date and it looks promising. It still kept Jaeger's vision of a sequel set in California with small, segmented levels and similar game mechanics to what they had set up in the early 2010s. Yet, shockingly, it was still running on Unreal Engine 4, but running on a far better version and setup than Jaeger could do at the time. This game had one of the most interesting developments of any game I've played, and I wanted to share this with you as the context for what I'll be saying in the remainder of the good and bad segment. So let me properly touch on the complaint that I have with this game. Notice how I say complaint without the S. I actually really only have one thing to complain about with this game, so I'm gonna save it for last and touch on some of the more smaller things that are good about this game. I love the little hidden easter eggs and characters that are present in the game. This can include hints and subtle nods to Benoit, the setting of Dead Island 1, or just Sam B himself being present, saying some of his famous lines from the first entry in the series. The interactions between some characters actually makes me feel like I'm in Los Angeles. Like the side quest involving a YouTuber who wants to make a killer video to post to her millions of followers. This is just what most people in LA do, and it's so accurate that it's hurting my soul. <laughs> With the massive three pillars of gameplay that I mentioned earlier, it's good to see that it's all easy to understand and isn't super complicated. But in a way, that's kind of the problem. This game does not feel like a game from 2023. It feels like a game from 2015. It's so simple and fun that it just feels like a hyperactive version of a modded Left 4 Dead 2 lobby. And while this isn't necessarily a bad thing, it's something that doesn't go unnoticed. Which leads me to my biggest complaint that I have with this game. The fact that it isn't a true open world game. Let me compare this to the original Dead Island for just a moment so you can see where I'm coming from. While some areas in Dead Island 1 were locked behind story progression, once you got past it, you were able to explore the entirety of the island of Benoit without ever needing a loading screen. And that was in 2011. Dead Island 2 has you take a full loading screen when traveling to any of its 11 different locations. And while each location is open world in of itself to some extent, it just feels like I'm playing a squared off sandbox game. This game, after taking quite literally 10 years to develop, 100% deserved to be a true open world game, like its original developers Jaeger Productions intended it to be. Even when the game was handed over to Dambuster Studios in 2019, what was stopping them from taking Unreal Engine 4, an engine that had more than proven itself by this point to work with open world games, and turning Dead Island 2 into the game it rightfully deserved to be. Just imagine the entire city of Los Angeles, a map that rivals something like, say, the entirety of Los Santos from GTA 5 or something similar. Imagine drop kicking zombies off of skyscrapers, side quests involving bank heists with zombies chasing your tail, and seeing even more fun easter eggs scattered throughout the city. Realistically though, it's possible that Dead Island 2 was so deep in the water by 2019 that Dan Buster and Deep Silver just wanted to get this game done and ship it out the door. Even if that that meant sacrificing the one thing that would have made this game even better, a true open world experience, just like it was planned to be over a decade ago. But with the ending of the game leaving room for a potential third entry into the series, hope still stands for the first real open world Dead Island game since its first entry back in 2011. But given how Dead Island 2's development ended up going, I don't think we're ever going to see a third installment. So. What are my final thoughts on Dead Island 2? I really do like this game, far better than I initially expected. Its gameplay is pretty simple, which is one of its best features in my opinion. Most games have systems that can be hard to fully understand, or mislead the player in ways that they may screw them over later on. Dead Island 2 keeps all of its gameplay systems straight to the point, with no BS thrown in. It tells you how it works right from the get-go, and that's it. This was actually the main reason why the developers made it so simple, as they believe that it's a major problem in the industry, so they chose to keep it simple, and I'm proud for them for making that 
brave decision. The amount of different weapons to choose from makes for both fun and engaging combat, and allows players to choose how they want to slay their way through Hell A. Speaking of Hell A, as much as I've said that the open world aspect of this game is extremely small, that doesn't mean that Dan Buster Studios did an incredible job with their version of Los Angeles. With so many things to find and collect through Hell A, it makes this world feel refreshing to come back to time and time again, regardless of how small that world might be. The visuals are spot on, as this game has some of the best gore I have seen in a long time, to the point that it made me nauseous in multiple instances. The stunning views of Los Angeles are breathtaking, and a soft reminder of what this game could have been. This game was 10 years in the making, a living legend that sat, waiting for its time to shine, constantly being beaten down by its multiple developers and even maybe Deep Silver themselves, before finally reappearing on stage at Gamescom, telling the world that it was finally ready and it was finally time to come home, even if sacrifices had to be made to get there. This game has a looming shadow over it in my opinion. That being, what if Jaeger's open world demo that leaked in 2020 actually ended up being the game we got? Obviously being more akin to its 2023 release version outside of that, but what if that was the case? How much would this game have sold then? And how big of a deal would this game have been? We may never know the answer unless we see a third game in the franchise in the distant future. But sadly, I'm not counting on that. And I don't expect to see a new major Dead Island game anytime soon. Quite frankly, I'd even go as far as to say that this is where the franchise ends. But if you're looking for an action-packed, zombie smashing, and downright fun as hell time, this game is an absolute blast to play, and I urge you to give it a shot sometime because you won't regret it. Was it worth the decade-long wait? I'll let you make that decision. Anyways, I've had enough of slaying hot babes in LA, and I actually want to find a hot babe of my own in real life, so I'ma head out. My name is Panda Power Sauce, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye